physical situatedness, if you will, its form, is what makes it a chair, I mean, that's so trivial. That's so profoundly trivial. Yes, he means that. Obviously, he means that. That's what he's saying here. But he's also discussed Aristotle earlier, so the assumption is that he recognizes form as being more than just the literal shape that it takes, right? That he has to mean, then, that we're talking about form in terms of Aristotelian functionality, right? The ness of a thing, the N-E-S-S of a thing. N-E-S-S being the function that that thing serves, right? That's why we can talk about many different forms of matter being, um, in a sense, representatives of a chair. You can have a metal chair, a plastic chair, a wooden chair, blah, 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 a virtual chair, a drawing of a chair, um, so that, in a sense, the function is preserved, right? And then we can have discussions on, you know, sort of varying degrees of that, but in terms of the discussion of what a thing is, it's form plus matter. Doesn't really, uh, nothing to be honest with you, novel there, because for those of us who understand philosophy, this is rather old, right? We, we know that um, the thing is form plus matter. Okay, so last, lastly in um, section 1.2, the three characteristics of a thing then. So what we've done is we've been able then to synthesize a greater appreciation and understanding of what the thingly element will be and what the thing actually is in terms of a very abstract discussion on just things. So three characteristics of things. These three modes of defining thingness conceive of the thing as one, a bearer of traits. So if we're talking about things, one, bearer of traits, two, as the unity of the manifold of sensation. And three, as formed matter. So this is what things are. Things are bearers of traits. We recognize that traits designate, point to, send us to things. We also recognize on a deeper level, we should understand now, on a deeper level, that we, we see the overlap between traits, properties, and the assemblage of properties around the core of the thing, that that core of the thing must be unified in sensation, we'll complicate this later, so that the perceiver can have epistemological recognition of the thing. So, it's important, however, to recognize that the propositional nature, the sentence structure of the cat is on the mat as propositional, um, as its propositional relationship does not have a one-to-one -one sort of direct transposition with the thing structure there being a cat on the mat, right? So that for Heidegger, at least, we cannot reduce metaphysical existence to linguistic sort of articulation. There are things within, well, and, and, you know, well, I don't want to critique that. So, this is what Heidegger says. Heidegger then says, we can then further reduce both the sentence structure and the thing structure to something more primordial for both, sort of a commonly derived conceptual ancestor <coughs> in a hybridized evolutionary sense, I guess. And then lastly, formed matter isn't simply what it sounds like, forming matter though it is that. It is matter being physically manipulated to, to assume a particular sort of a physical situatedness, but really formed matter being matter formed for function, and the artisan being the conduit with which you bring in this function into existence. And I think the best artists, undeniably, I think the be undeniably, the best artists in the world that have lived that are living, that will ever live, make a profound recognition. It's almost impossible not to have ego at this point, which is sort of why I'm in the chain in this sense. I mean, you should be humble to an extent, but it's, it's almost impossible not to have an ego once you recognize that you are the conduit for introducing a new functionality into the world. Like, 
you're the reason why people have, uh, I'll give you a super simple, you know, I'm hip hop, so I gotta keep it funky. Like, Jay-Z recognized that everybody prior to him, for all practical purposes, bent the cap. So you get the brim, the brim you bend the cap. Um, Jay-Z was like, I'm not gonna bend my caps. I'm gonna take my caps right off the shelf, put them on my head, and I'm gonna have a flat brim cap. This is a stupid example, but it's true. He recognizes that insofar as he goes out there with the flat brim cap, and everybody sees him because he's in a position to be seen, that people are going to emulate what he does. Um, and, and then the coolest thing for me was to see white kids in the suburbs walking around with flat brim caps. I can't imagine what their parents must have been thinking because <laughs> it looked profoundly odd when it initially started in the, in the mid to late 90s. But now you see a, a white suburban dude walking around with a flat brim cap, you don't think twice about it. You're like, okay, you know, he's got a cap on. No, you, you don't think anything about it. What happened was, and, and this is a stupid example, but what happened was Jay-Z, in a sense, had to have recognized that he could transform the very function of wearing a hat. Who thinks about transforming how people wear hats? No one thinks about that. <laughs> okay, you can wear it to the front, you can wear it to the side, you can wear it to the back. We've exhausted all possibilities for how you can functionally wear a hat. And he took it to another level. right? Uh, and this is a one trivial example coupled with you know, the, the manifold things that he and other artists have done. But in a very real sense, he transformed the function of the hat, literally, right? And he made the, the functional transformation of the hat mainstream. So it's not just him doing it. It's like everyone does it now. So that there is now a new possibility that didn't exist prior to Jay-Z's sort of adopting a new functional use for the hat. <laughs> it's ridiculous, but it's genius, but it's genius. So... You know, I, I take my markers from the universe. I take my markers from Heidegger, from Jay-Z, from, from the possible existences which haven't yet been actualized. And part of this ridiculously manic sort of YouTube series, uh, and just, just for context, this, I'm going to wrap this bit up because I need to get into the next section. But just for context, um, it is, I left my house uh, at 6.15 a.m. Eastern Time. I came to the office. No one's in the university yet. Um, I've been lecturing for an hour and a half. And I have class that I teach um, tonight at 6 p.m. I'm going to go home, process this video, upload it to cyberspace, work on a publication that I'm going to be doing, um, a presentation later in the next few months um, at Oxford University, uh, and then come back to school and do my, my class tonight. With all that on my plate, with all that on my plate, why get up at 6 o'clock and do this? Because I don't need to do it. Because there is a very real sense of me, Jason J. Campbell, transforming the function of education. Um, and I really honestly, honestly, honestly believe that I am a human rights activist. This is the face of it. Because education is a human right. And all of this free education is um, a form of activism. So I am a human rights activist, and that's what gets me up, right, is a recognition that I can transform the function of education as a person. So, you know, despite the fact that I got crap to do, uh, no matter what I'm going to do in this world, it will never be as significant as what I'm doing here with you. So I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to me talk about all this crazy crap. <laughs> and I'm joking, of course it's not crap. It is definitely crazy though. So with that, thanks again for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.